It's Comics Are Great, the visual storytelling show recorded live every other Wednesday at the Ann Arbor District Library in lovely downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan, comics.aadl.org. And this is the show where we talk about visual storytelling, making comics, writing stories, communicating visually, the lifestyle of people who, uh, creative people who make things visually, all the stuff that surrounds this medium that drives us all mad. My name is Jer Jersey Drozd, cartoonist and teaching artist. With me today, we're going to talk about being positive, the power of positive. Um, and, and how to straddle the line between being funny and being positive. And I'm so excited to have on the show for the first time, but we've known each other for a long time, Jim Lujan of JimLujan.com. Hey, Jim. Hey, Jersey. I'm a big fan. have all your albums. <laughs> the, you're, you're thinking of the guy who makes the basses then. Oh, sorry. Uh, but I have all of your albums. You are a cartoonist, animator, filmmaker. You make music. Uh, you do it all. Uh, uh, if you go to jimluhan.com, you can get to the YouTube page. So you, you do a lot of animated cartoons. Gosh, how many are on there now on your YouTube channel? Um, on there, I think there's about 40 or 35 or something like that, but I've done over 50. Holy moly. And all by yourself. And I want to talk, that's where I want to start with this is talking about your process. Mostly, yeah. I use guest stars. I mean, some of the guest stars are just amazing voice talents that do a wonderful work wonderful work jersey just yeah amazing yeah oh hey didn't you do one <laughs> it just it just struck me right now you know what's funny i forgot that i was in one of your cartoons yes. uh you you actually didn't didn't i appear in a cartoon with mark rudolph at one yes. point and kevin cross and, and a kevin. few other folks uh, yeah um Jer Jer i had jersey play a it was just a real quick, like, couple of lines, but you were a music critic. That's right. We, and Thanks. actually, in my... I actually have a clip of that <laughs> to play if we want to watch it real quick. So Matt does his research, and Matt grabbed a clip of from March of the Swizzle Stick Army. You want to pull it up, <laughs> Matt, and we'll just sit quiet? Live from Miami, I'm backstage partying with one of the hottest bands in the land, the Swizzle Stick Army. How are you guys like in Miami so far? I do not like your question, and you must be maced. <laughs> Welcome back to Crosstalk. Bad behavior and blistering beats. What's the verdict on the Swizzle Stick Army? Their music transcends pop or avant-garde noise rock. It's a dichotomy of primal catharsis. I like the drums. They're cool. What do you think about the treatment the band's been getting on your trip here to Florida? Florida, you make a big deal about throwing a television set out of a window, yet you let your alligators roam wildly on the streets. I speak for the band, Hans, Hans, Fritz, and Hans, when I say that we are both repulsed and disgusted by Florida. The orange juice is good, that's it. So, the, the <laughs> it's one of my favorite gags, uh, is the when the, the lead singer of the Swizzle Stick Army is saying, you know, he's, he's, he's uh, poo-pooing Florida, and he's saying how terrible Florida is and how much they hate Florida. Then there's a pause. The orange juice is good, but that's it. That's like, that's like a Jim Lujan joke right there. That happened. <laughs> that's their manager. His name is The Trout. Ah. <laughs> the Trout. Loita. Uh, but, okay, so there was an example of the kind of cartoons that you do. I mean, you've got a lot on there, like uh, Freak Daddy. Uh, John Henry Unicorn was a big one. That was a... Uh, Really, really cool one. And there was, was there, there was more than one John Henry Unicorn, right? Yes. The, um, there was, um, and for those that don't know, John Henry Unicorn is my cartoon about a sort of a cult leader. And, and uh, there was John Henry Unicorn, which is the first one. And then there was uh, Day of the Unicorn. That's right. Which was a prison film. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that was it. For, oh, no. Then there was, there's a, then I did a third one that he was featured in called, and I love this title, and thank you Bill Moran, my friend, for saying this phrase on accident, um, Faith Healing Through Superior Firepower <laughs> is the title of that third cartoon, and that's the, kind of the trilogy. Um, we were in a car, and, my, and, and I was talking with my friend Bill, and I don't know what we were talking about, but he made a joke, like, because some kind of diplomacy through, you know, like, like, let's go get him. Right. He, he just said real nonchalantly, he goes, oh, yeah. He goes, 
faith healing through superior firepower. <laughs> like that. <laughs> and I was like, hold on, let me write that down. So, okay, <laughs> let's, let's, let's jump on that because like, you did that when we were just doing the pre-show, just kicking things around a little bit. Th- this is like, you're, you're always carrying a notebook with you. No, 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 no. I'm at my office, so I have it right here. Oh. Uh, um, but but, you, I, but I do yeah. I do once in a while will write down names or band names, <laughs> and uh, some of them are ridiculous and will never be used. But give me one of the uh, ones that will never be used. Oh God! All right, hold on. Let me look at my phone. <laughs> well, they might be used, but um, one of the band names that uh, <laughs> that I I don't know where this came from. There's um, my my idea for a punk band. <laughs> Was is a uh, Mary Tyler whore? <laughs> <laughs> I could already see the uh, the high contrast Xerox posters nailed to the the telephone pole for that one. Um, there's oh the, my my one of my favorite bands Coyote Turd, <laughs> and that, they're a good one. And then um oh and then there's Haircut Reward. <laughs> those are those are really good bands. Um, <laughs> To go to what you were, we were talking about earlier, yeah. um, before we started broadcasting, Jersey mentioned that he had, the other night, he had a stress nightmare f- from puppets. <laughs> right. Okay. So let's deconstruct this. Now, why was that so funny to you? Like, what is it about that that particularly grabs you? It was so real. You just said, oh, yeah, and the other night I had a stress nightmare from puppets. <laughs> and in my mind, I just started thinking, like, like that, I told you, this, that's something an angry father would say at the breakfast table. Like... Tyler, eat your oatmeal. Don't you realize I had a stress nightmare from puppets? You know, it's just like so ridiculous. That for, so yes, I did write that down as well. I had a stress nightmare from puppets. <laughs> and it, and the fact that you said it so honestly, it's just Jersey. That's Jersey right there. I like that. Uh, uh, but I, what, I, what I think is interesting about that is that it's a moment, it's a teachable moment of learning, like, how does somebody identify what is comedy material and what isn't, right? Mm-hmm. Um, like, it's, not, it's not, not necessarily, well, let me ask you, how much of making your cartoons, because most of your cartoons are very, very funny, um, and it's in, it, you can tell it's intended. You're not a dramatist, necessarily, or a documentarian. These are, like, really um, satirical and funny cartoons. Um, how much of this is like grinding through the joke and like grinding through iterations of the joke, and how much of it is like just listening to life and finding interesting things and then pulling them out? Hmm. I I think an average cartoon that I do starts from uh, a kernel of an idea that I end up kind of sticking with. Um, uh, like stress nightmare from puppets <laughs> is probably not going to be the title of a new cartoon, but it might appear as a line in one. Right. Um. I, a lot of times are character driven too. It's the char- If I have a certain character, I did one called Prince of Pomona, and that one that, won an that, award, by the way. Yes. Yeah. The Nomi. Oh yeah, the Nomi right behind you there on the yeah. on the bureau, and yeah. and. And that cartoon was driven by a character that in modern day times, um, and he's a white character, he lives his life at, as Prince, except he works at a yogurt shop. But he, you know, he, want, he has a little motorcycle or a bike or whatever, and he wears his hair like Prince did in 1984. So he's living out like the Purple Rain superhero fantasy. Uh-huh. And I just thought, to me, that idea, um, here, I'm going to give an exclusive, exclusive, um, Originally, the original title I have written down in this little notebook um, for this, I had it, it just popped in my head, The White Prince of Pomona. And I don't know why. I, I saw something or something, and I just, at one time, I wrote that down, The White Prince of Pomona. Maybe it was like the Fresh Prince of Bel Air or something that, you know, subconsciously. But um, so it, it started from there, and then I thought, what would his name be? Oh, Purple Ron, because, you know. <laughs> And then it just kind of it snowballed from there. So that on that particular one, the jokes um, sort of wrote themselves as the events unfolded in his line. It's a very short cartoon, but see how the character kind of spawns that, you know. And 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 so I, I don't often hit any many walls when I'm I'm writing, which is, could be good and could be bad, <laughs> but um, but it's usually the characters 
you know, kind of, it, it sounds so corny and cliche. Oh, the characters write themselves. And it does sound you know, cliche, but, but it's true. It's but actually it true. true. Yeah. Uh, but because uh, I noticed that when I'm doing freelance writing um, for gigs, I'll get uh, some creative constraints where they say, we want it to be about this and take place here. Right. And then I'm like, well, what can I do with that? What can I do with that? And I, you know, grind through a bunch of different ideas. And none of them really compel me. The moment I say, what does this character want? Right. And, and w w why would they want that? And how do they mess it up? Uh, then all of a sudden I start getting into really interesting places with like working through the, the freelance gig within the constraints that they have. Right. Um, it's, yeah. Cause, it, cause yeah. otherwise it could be forced. If you just yeah. start writing, I don't know, if you don't think about that stuff at all, um, then you can, it sounds, it just sounds fake. Like a person wouldn't do that, you know? Yeah. What? And then if you do the opposite, if you think too much about it, then it becomes like an exercise in, in just like self-indulgence a little bit. So in the middle somewhere is where the sweet spot is for that. Are you, what do you mean when you like self-indulgence? How? Like when you think if, if like, for example, um, if, if let's use Star Wars for an example. Okay. If uh, how it would have been a way way a less less good film if they would have spent another half an hour on Luke's going. Why can't I go to Tashi Station? Right. You know, let's let's think about that. Why can't I? You know. And then like him arguing with Uncle Ben for like you know you know well you didn't clean your room last week <laughs> Luke and I told you, you know she didn't clean your space room that like the dynamic between them for you know another 30 40 minutes right it would have you know it would have been a different film shut up yeah. uncle owen you don't know me <laughs> <laughs> you touched me uncle owen <laughs> i wasn't going there the film, I, but... I was thinking of him putting on space headphones then turning on like the record player and locking the door but <laughs> That's what you have robots for. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> All right. So, okay. I want to talk a little bit about um, the – I don't want to talk about your process, Jim. But I do want to talk about your process. Uh, I, I don't mind. <laughs> My process. Well, it, it's interesting to me that um, – because we talked about this years ago, back in the Art and Story days. Like, you, you were doing a podcast, actually, called Ghettomation. Mm -hmm. You had a Ghettomation website. Um, which was like this kind of cheering this idea of, you know, um, kind of like the punk rock ethos of making animation. Like you don't yes. need a big fancy yeah. studio to do it, right? Yeah. Uh, use what you got. And back yeah. back then, you were doing everything, am I, am I correct? You were doing everything in Flash, right? <laughs> back then is still back now. <laughs> um, yeah, I just do it a little bit better, I think. Yeah. Um, not drawn in Flash. I always have to clarify that. I use Flash as an, anima an animating software, but I don't draw anything in Flash. What do you draw on? Because if I remember right, you were drawing like on anything back in uh, the days of John Henry Unicorn and March of yes. the Army. I am drawing in these right here, sketchbooks. So, and these are normally what I use to do my cartoons in and, and such, and I scan them and, and color them in. However, in this new, the latest uh, film that I did, Foreverland, I, I got one of these stylists, um, a bamboo stylist, uh -huh. and I started cheating and cheating, and, and pretty soon it went from being 10%. 20%, then it jumped to like, I'm now I do about 60% of my stuff electronically. Yeah. I still draw in the, in, the, in the sketchbook. I'll never stop. Because you can travel with a sketchbook. You can't travel with an iMac and a bamboo unless you get a laptop. Oh. No, I wouldn't do that. It's, it's just more trouble than it's worth. Yeah. Because yeah. when the Terminators come and take our machines away from us and they turn on us, then... How will I do my cartoons then? Because yeah, mm -hmm. all those digital artists are going to be like, "What is this paper thing? I don't know what to do with this. This is nonsense, mm -hmm. right?" Uh, but you'll still have you'll still have your chops. You'll still be yeah. uh, tuned to concert pitch and drawing on paper. But uh, that that is that is interesting that you are finally drawing sixty percent digitally. Yeah, uh, yeah. But you're animating this entire, and we're going to talk about this feature that you just did cl counterclockwise and forever land which is an hour long like all the other films that we talked about were fairly short like what 10 yeah. minutes yeah the longest film i had done previously was 18 minutes okay and that was bobby churro i have a long version of that but this That's is a boxing movie 
fifty six minutes, fifty seven minutes. This 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 film. This is a big undertaking. And and I mean, I, I wonder if I could just play the the trailer, Matt, for uh, Counterclockwise and Foreverland. Yep, I've got it queued up. All right, here we go. I think that's Swizzle Stick Army. Movie Fun Fest! <laughs> <laughs> Matt, Matt's going to pull up the, the trailer. Here we go. Actually, all my cartoons look the same. It's just I change the voices. Yeah, sorry about that. I do have the other one queued up now. <laughs> sorry. I'm over it. I'm over it. It's okay. <laughs> Give me that movie back. Yeah, you can get me a screwdriver on the rocks. Yo, jam that screwdriver in my ear because this music is terrible. Ooh, look, Deacon. Madame Mesmeralda. Long ago, there was a glove. A glove that brought joy and music throughout the universe. This glove was powered by love and positive energy. But I must tell you now that dark forces have retrieved this glove. And they are using it to suppress the power of positivity. The universe is out of order. And it is your job to set the clock right. Turn it counterclockwise. Oh, hell no. Slap my mama. Okay, so as we saw with that trailer, not only yeah. is this thing 56 minutes long, but it was like an epic undertaking in terms of, you know, crowd scenes, action scenes. You have armies of people <laughs> going to war in this movie. You have a whole bunch of different settings. It takes place in Cleveland. It takes place in this place called Foreverland. Let's start with like the, the elevator pitch for what the film is first, then we can dig into like what it took to make it. Um, we did... Uh, three videos. I did three videos for Counterclockwise. Moonwalk, Outside the Lines, and Whip. And during the make, actually during the making of the first video, Moonwalk, we started, it was such an easy collaboration. We just, we clicked right away. They gave me full creative, you know, freedom. Um, they said run wild with it. And after the first video, the character Mr. Creep, the guy the, with the white hat and stuff, um, I, we were saying, wow, he, what a great villain. We should kind of put him in each of these videos a little bit or hide, you know, have a theme going somehow. And uh, then it turned into, uh, um, like, we should, like we just would say, we should do a movie one day. We, we should do a movie one day. And that turned into, we were on a, a podcast together, uh, Fanboy Radio, and the host, Scott Hines, who ended up being in the movie as Infinitus, um, <laughs> He asked them a question. They were the guests, and he asked them, so what's going on? What's your next project? And they said, we're doing a movie with Jim Lujan. <laughs> like they announced <laughs> it right there. And I was on the phone. I was on the, the call with them, and I thought, why not? You know, they, they, they let the cat out the bag. We might as well let the cat run free. And, and so the way we built this movie was um, kind of four minutes at a time. So it's like in little sections. I, I built it kind of like a painting. Um, when I had time to work on it, I'd work on it. If I didn't, it went to the side. And I had a little time, I'd work on it. So it really was one of those how to eat an elephant a bite at a time. It, we, we built this a bite at a time. And um, they, they added so much to the, to the film as well. I mean, their personalities, their ad, a lot of their ad libs, a lot of their, you know, their music, you know. And um, yeah, and we should say this is this is a musical stuff. fantasy adventure yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, and, and we really collaborated too because I would send them stuff and they would add stuff to it, and I and they would send me stuff and I would add stuff to it. So it happened very naturally, and uh, just when we when I could work on it. 
so let me let me start with the, this question because this is something that I'm trying to train myself to do is that I tend to when I see impressive undertakings is that I, like a lot of people I'll say like oh man how hard was that rather I think the more interesting question is how fun was that to do yeah. uh, something with that much variety of location setting and then also like one of the most over top, over the top villains I've ever seen in your films in terms of Infinitus played by Scott Hines who gosh you know when I was watching it if I didn't know it was him I would have thought it was Paul F. Tompkins it yeah. sounded so <laughs> similar in the performance it was eerily that's and he was it I mean that's he didn't he did everything we call him one take Hines <laughs> <laughs> he did everything so quickly because I wanted Scott Hines you yeah. know I wanted exactly what he brought to it is exactly why I cast him as that because it was perfect for what when you know he didn't have to try to do you know anything too uncomfortable. He was like, "Be funny, attack it the way you want to attack it," mm -hmm. um, and we did have fun doing it. That was the key of it. We had a lot of fun making this, and this is one of those projects where I'm sure there's people working at studios and animation studios that would say, "Man, I wish I could do my own thing," and I would just have total freedom. Well. That's where we're at right now. We have total freedom, so we might as well make the most of it. So that's kind of where we're at with it. But, you know, I, I talk with other cartoonists who are, you know, they've got a day job as cartoonists, and then they clock out, and it's like, gosh, you know, uh, either A, I don't feel the energy. I feel like it's creatively spent from my day job to put any time into working on the stuff at night, or... They'll say, um, you know, I don't have the time to make it really good, as good as I do for my day job uh, as a cartoonist or, or as a designer or anything. Uh, or whether, whatever kind of day job you got. Like, there's this whole thing, of, there's this whole uh, mystery around the, the time and energy constraints of doing something that is totally your creative passion project. So how do you keep it fun enough to do to make it so that it's not those things to you? Um, well, approaching it like four minutes at a time really helped. Yeah. Because you, it's it. We did this in sprints, and then we just tied a bunch of these little sprints together, and it turned into a marathon. So that was a, that was a way of keeping the energy fresh. Was just working on it a small piece at a time. We didn't get we didn't get overwhelmed, and um, I mean, really, true, truly, it when there was there was a time toward the end when I was like, man, I'm like running on fumes trying to finish this because there was a couple of other projects that happened during the middle of this which actually delayed Foreverland um, and I remember thinking man okay this is the time where you gotta like kinda just suck it up and, and finish it and I, by doing that I found a new energy at the end because at the end I think I had more fun than even at the beginning like the last you know and, and, and Foreverland was built in sequence so the first thing you see in it Foreverland, the opening shot is the first thing I did for it. So you didn't, thing. you did not board this whole thing out in advance. No, not at all. There, okay. some scenes, it was done scene by scene, and some scenes I would c kind of do thumbnails for, and then some scenes none. Like some scenes were just built. Let me see if I can find a thumbnail for you. Some scenes were just completely built on the fly, you know. So, um, let me see. It might. <laughs> Here's an example. These thumbnails take weeks and weeks to do. Um, <laughs> I bet. Uh, holy cow. So, and because I'm working on it myself, I don't have somebody here that I need to translate the method to. Mm -hmm. um, that's why I'm able to do like these super cryptic, you can't even tell what they are, <laughs> uh, thumbnails they, because I know what they mean. They were, they were, they were was, readable. Yeah. They were readable. Um, but uh, the, I mean, that's the thing is that you're doing it all on your own. And that, that also sounds like incredibly daunting to say like, oh my gosh, I'm going to animate something entirely by myself with armies racing at each other and stuff. So, um, okay. So you found, but over the years you found a approach that works for you in this, the sketching in the sketchbooks, scanning in the flash. There's a, there's a style to your animation that I think is like essentially Jim Lujan. Um, you're not doing Pinocchio here. You're doing much more limited stuff than Pinocchio. And I'm, what I'm curious about is, and I mean, anybody who watched the video saw that. 
Uh, so my my next thought is is uh, how does that affect the choices that you make in terms of what projects you take on? Like, is there a thing where you're like, well, that's not a Jim Luhan thing either because you know it, it's it's technically too demanding or it doesn't have the voice that I want. It doesn't it doesn't have the spirit that I want. Like, how do you know? Like, okay, I'm. I'm Layering on I know like 12, what you mean. I know you yeah. mean like yeah, like what what's the criteria? Yeah. Um, um well for Foreverland, even though it's huge, epic sci fi, I I it just has to have my spin on it. It had to be in my style mm -hmm. and just use that as an advantage. Um I was just talking with somebody the other day and, and about uh my level of animation and even if I had every resource in the world, I would only boost my animation by about 50%, you know, another 50%. It wouldn't have that much more movement. It would have, it would be done, you know, a little bit more, you know, uh, de uh, the animation would have more animation, but it wouldn't be um, Walt Disney. It's just not, not meant to be for what it is. It, it has a certain look. Um, I, I would say you asked me earlier too about if somebody is has a project that is daunt like they where, where am I going to get the time? Yeah, I would say part of the criteria for your project should be what you can do, not just what you want to do, but what you can do mm. now. So um, if you can only do a certain level of animation right now, do a project that um, calls upon that certain level of animation. Um, there's something that I keep in mind too when I'm animating. It looks worse to have a really well animated uh, realistic movement that's a little bit off mm. than it does to have something that's way off and has a little bit of realism. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. I know the exactly. human eye looks at that and goes, that looks creepy. You right. know? It's an Uncanny Valley thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. It could Because like, when you get about, you know, get into any of your films the the uh there's a consistency in the way you do it that makes it plausible so that i'm not going well why did the guy's hand like well for instance there's a, there's a scene where a character slapping another character in the <laughs> film and uh you're not seeing the full arm swing it's sort of like arm here arm here arm here but at that point in the film, like I'm so signed on to this world and and, and the, the the context that you built through the way you, that you animate it that I didn't even think twice about it, right? And, like I made a note because I'm watching it analytically, like I got to follow up on this with Jim, but uh, as I'm watching it, it's like the, the it, it's not a realistic movement, but I believe it. Does that Jersey, make sense? Jersey, I, I spent two hundred thousand dollars to do that scene. <laughs> I used motion capture. You put the the, the golf I, balls we on had somebody. To mortgage our house. <laughs> Sorry, Jim. I'm very hurt. Right now. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, okay, I want to. I want to round back on something else you said earlier when you talked about how this thing started, um, counterclockwise in Foreverland. You've been you've been doing the circuit, and you were on. Um, you did a, a fanboy radio special, uh, or it was a Foreverland special, which people can find at JimLuhan.com. You were on Independent Road with P Peter Palmiotti. You were on. Um, oh, what was the, the the geek podcast that you were on? Uh, Last uh, Geek Standing. Nerd. Uh, Jack of all nerds. Jack of all nerds. Yes, you were also on that recently. So listen to all those, and everybody should because Jim is uh, a marvelous storyteller and a really pleasant guy to listen to. It helped me get through my work day, made me feel good about life, but. One of the things you talked about in one of those other, other interviews is you said, uh, counterclockwise said that they found you because you were just doing your own thing. They went, they, they were just looking through YouTube, found these really cool cartoons on YouTube, and said, hey, "This guy's awesome. We should get him to do a music video." And then they approach you. Yeah, yeah, they, that's exactly how it happened. And I've been approached to do animation for music videos before, but a lot of times when you click on the links, it's just it's something I can't do. This like the songs are really. Why do I attract these people? And, <laughs> and when they sent, well, there's there's kind of a double sided thing. When they, when they sent De, uh, Deacon sent me the email, he said I'm a big fan. And through talking to him, he was mentioning specific things about my cartoons, which right there my ego went. Yeah. Um, like wow, this guy knows my stuff, and he's an actual fan of my stuff. And then the other thing was I went. Uh, that, that sealed the deal is when I went and listened to their music. 
I was like, okay, I'm going to jump on this before somebody else does because they're that legit. Like they're that versatile and interesting and spacey and weird and fun. And so I thought this is like, this is a slow pitch up the middle. So, and, and then add to that the creative freedom, you know. So right, right off the bat we said, okay, we're going to do three music videos. And then then the rest kind of happened naturally. And, and I use that word a lot. It was organic and natural. That's how this whole thing happened. It just snowballed. So when we're having, we had fun with it. So, well, what what I I did not hear at any point during your story is, oh boy, I better do this because it'll really help my career, or oh, I better do this because it'll be good exposure. Oh, I better do this because. Uh, I need more people to see my work. This was something where it sounds to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, Jim, it, it, it was pretty selfishly motivated when you were uh, responding to this request. It was like... No, I completely... I just thought, I, this is good for me. And I pushed <laughs> them to the side. In fact, do you guys really need to be in these things? Can I just animate myself? No, but, they, but you know... No, like, no. It, honestly, there, there's that thought. Anytime, just like when they contacted me, I'm sure they thought, oh, this will be so good that people will jump onto it. But see, that's the whole thing. Yeah. If you approach something, I think anybody on any level, if they approach something where they say, this is, I believe in this so much and this is going to be so good that this is going to make me a huge star. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you think, if you sit and go, well, what can I do to be a huge star? <laughs> then that's when you start <laughs> making fun of Kim Kardashian and, and you know, and whatever's the, la- the flavor of the month thing to make fun of and that's fine and there's 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 room for that but that's just not where this came from this but there was that thought in it jersey we wanted we wanted the whole point of doing foreverland um was it, it well it encompasses this one of the points for doing foreverland was for other eyeballs to see this and for somebody to see it and say hey we want to distribute this you know on a, sure. on a wider level or we want to make a television show about this or Whatever, you know, we want to make electric blankets with your, you know. Of course, of course. But it's just, it's interesting to me that, like, as a guy who, you know, I think anybody in the creative arts, like, you go to a comic convention, you're tabling, you're going to meet that guy or gal who comes up to you and says, hey, I've got a brilliant idea for a new comic. You should draw it for me. We've never met. And they're not necessarily familiar with my work, but they just they just want to get an artist, right? And they just want to, mm-hmm. they're, they're out there pitching, trying to find a collaborator. Um, and you know, I, I talk to young or beginning cartoonists who will say things like, well, you know, I don't have much on my resume yet. This could be a thing. And then I say, well, no, are you excited about it? Are you actually excited to do the thing? Have you read it? And do you, are you responding to it in any way? Or are they a big fan of you? Are they coming to you because there's something unique in the way you do things that only you can bring what is needed to this thing? And then that would be satisfying to you as well, right? But but when it's this kind of like um, cold call, like, hey, are you an artist? Would you like to draw something for somebody? Hey, I'm a really important person, and after all, you should work for me. What I heard in your story is that they knew, they were familiar with your work. They wanted because they wanted what you could bring to their music. And then, yes, you think about the fame and the money and stuff afterwards, but what's initially, I think, interesting is that you went at it because it was exciting and, and compelling as a project to you, right? Yeah, and it's just, it, you, it, speaking of music, it is like music, because if you have an, a, one musician that another musician comes and says, hey, we should write something together, we should record together, it excites them because they know what the end product could be, and I think we both kind of felt that. We both knew, like, wow, if we hook up, this could be really interesting and, and, you know, something really good can, so, and we're really happy with, with what came out and how fast and how easy, relatively speaking, easy it was. Um, and uh, it's all in all, it, it, I'm very glad to, um, to be involved with something that does have a positive message um, to it. Let's go but there. Yeah, Let's yeah go it's there. not corny, not positive, you know, where everything's sunshine and rainbows. It's got those, it's this dark <laughs> project, but uh, it's like a car. <sighs> it's this dark car with tinted windows, slowly creeping around the corner, but then it opens up, and inside of it, my pretty pony. <laughs> 
that that is that is an awesome metaphor for the experience of this film. And I, I, let's go there real quick because I mean, here's like here's one of my favorite scenes from the film. Um, problems. I, I'm not going to spoil anything, by the way, but you know, some significant problems get solved towards the end of the film. And uh, Infinitus is uh, he's on the ropes. He's not he's not defeated yet, but he's on the ropes. Things are looking bad for our villain. And then the, the, as what happens in these kinds of stories, because Infinitus has, like, enslaved the world. There's all these great flags that say, bow down. What an awesome catch line or catchphrase for a supervillain. I mean, I know every supervillain says that, but nobody's ever put it on a flag, bow down. Copyright. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, and so now the, the oppressed people are turning on uh, Infinitus, and it shows this, uh, this woman, and she says, Infinitus took my family. And the little boy says, uh, he came to our village and took our toys away. All right, it's getting pretty corny. <laughs> and then it switches to, Infinitus cut my hand off. Sucker came back and cut off my hook, too. What's up with that? <laughs> <laughs> so you diffuse, like, they're heading for, like, this corny, like, okay, the people are revolting against him. But then you slide in this joke to go, oh, but don't forget that we're having fun here, right? Yeah. That's Oscar worthy, too, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Sucker came back and cut my hook off. Uh, but what 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 I I think is the interesting thing here is that well and I should say also like there's like a lot of positive imagery like there's like this magical flower in a cage that is like somehow tied into like this positive energy that needs to be released back into the land. But when the skull headed guards show up and they're like, hey, hold it right there. That flower has laser eyes and burns the heads off of the skull warriors. <laughs> and, I'll yeah, you... and, and there's a ton of uh, Easter eggs in this. This is like the shining of animation. <laughs> there's so many. And, and we would have conversations, uh, Deacon and Kaya and I, about, um, yeah, this kind of represents this, and this represents that. And, and, uh, and, then, and then a lot of times they, they would ask me, well, wait a minute, Jim. Why, how, if they're stuck in this situation, why don't they just do this? And I go, um, because what you didn't see off camera was. <laughs> <laughs> so it just wrote itself. But, 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 but what, I, what I, I'm pointing at here is that I think is so fascinating is that you are a guy. And, and when I went back and looked at your older films, I was like, holy cow, it's been there the whole time. Is you're this guy who really straddles this line between being satirist and mildly acerbic but also really positive like even in like things like the swizzle stick army which has a lot of like you know physical humor people getting maced and then <laughs> <laughs> it's just like a theme in my cartoon and then satirical humor like you know like the 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 army of characters that you bring on to like like uh, do send-ups of like the music critic like the news people and etc and there's there's you make fun of news anchors in um uh, Foreverland as well. Um, having things like the villain reading Three-Eyed Lady magazine sideways and stuff like that. Um, you know, there, there's that stuff in there. There's, there's that, that, that comedy thing. And like we were talking about before we started recording, is like the comedy tends to be characterized as something that is an attack on something. You are attacking a thing. You're sending it up. You're satirizing it. You're calling out its flaws and foibles in a safe and uh, re amusing way. Um, so very rarely do you see like really positive comedy, you know, I, I can't think of many people who I would call a positive comic. Huh. You might well, be the only one. I, you know, <laughs> I think my heroes, I have weird heroes. So, and you kind of try to emulate your heroes a lot. So my, my heroes are people like Andy Kaufman mm -hmm. and Stanley Kubrick and just uh, Peter Chris. I don't know why I threw that in, but because um, <laughs> he never gets enough love and, and, that's and respect. That's right. Yeah, he's the yeah. cat man. Um, but my, I, I, we, I was, we were just talking the other day um, about. I wish there was a term for my style of humor because what it is is it's, it's not parody. It is a little bit satire, but it's. Um, exaggerated mm. humor that's what it is so if you take somebody and you just completely exaggerate them um, it's n it's not so much absurdist it's not Monty Python and it's not quite Will Ferrell 
It's more like maybe like in in the spectrum. Monty Farrell. <laughs> Weird Al Yankovic. Weird Al Yankovic hey. is kind of in that spectrum a little bit. Like, but you don't have like hot dog, Twinkie hot dog things. Uh, you know, uh, silly food humor. Yeah. Um, I well, I mean, like like the stress nightmare from puppets. <laughs> that is that epitomizes. That should be your autobiography title, by the way. But that that's right there. <laughs> that summarizes my. <laughs> to me, what's funny? It's like it's funny, but it's not supposed to be funny. <laughs> well, that should be the title of my autobiography. It's funny, but it's not supposed to be <laughs> <Yeah>. funny. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but but I mean, like, so how? I mean, I'm sure this is like a natural place where you come from because I, you know, we've hung out in real life, and like the, that was my first thing. Was like, wow wow, he is such a sweet guy. But, I mean, you know, part of being funny is like, you know, John Henry Unicorn's making fun of a specific type of guy. Uh, is there something in, is this, okay, here, I'll put it this way. Is it just a reflex of who you are, or is this something that you have to remind yourself of when you're writing your stories? Is like, you know, did I trip over into too dark a territory? Um, is there like some kind of mental check that you do to keep yourself on task? Um, the first one. Okay. So it's just natural. <laughs> That's all I have to say. No. Uh, um, was it always that way? I think so. I, right now I'm thinking about when I was a kid and we, uh, my cousin Mike and I, we made, made up tons of songs. And, uh, one time I, right when we first started, I was probably 11, no, I was 12 years old. We made up a song and it was a cutesy cutesy song. I, it was, it was like a parody on like a <clears throat> mariachi song and but I didn't speak Spanish so I would just make up <laughs> words <clears throat> and then we played that tape for my family they thought oh how cute how cute how cute but then they didn't know like the next and then we stopped the tape and the next song up was a song called <laughs> dog vomit and monkey pus <laughs> and they would not have thought that was so cute so there's like a weird parallel there there's that side but then there's that side but but and then and then again i always had this fear this phobia of uh my dad was a fireman you know very manly guy but did not cuss i don't know where that came from his family or what but he did not cuss and you you know don't even dare cuss in our house you know and he did not like foul language He's very, my, I said this before, my dad was the Mexican Bill Cosby. <laughs> he was. He looked like Bill Cosby kind of. He's built like him. And, and he, but, um, so I think that kind of in, gave me a guilt complex. Because, you know, you either rebel against your parents and, and become exactly the opposite. Or you just cower in shame and fear like I do and just do it secretly. You know, no, I mean, I think that's kind of where that limiter comes in within me. Uh -huh. You know, because of how I was raised by my, you know, now if my mom was, if my mom had been a single mom, oh, I'd be a horrible guy. I mean, I just, <laughs> she would have just let me do whatever. No. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be on the streets right now. Uh, okay. Well, we're, we're going to get to book recommendations in a minute. Um, uh, Rachel's going to be in the studio in just a few minutes. Uh, and, but I do need to talk with you about this revengeance thing. <gasps> yes. Uh, yes. Because, because you, my friend, are working on a film with Bill Plimpton. Bill freaking Plimpton. Yeah, how'd that happen? Yeah, how did that happen? I mean, I'm guessing. <clears throat> here's, here's my guess, and you correct me if I'm wrong. Doing your own thing, following your own passion, and, and pursuing your own voice by making videos on YouTube, and just making a lot of them, and then talking with people about them, uh, led to more people seeing your stuff, led to, oh, and going to film festivals and pushing your stuff out there, trying to get more people to watch your things at film festivals. Put you on the radar. Of this guy, Bill Plimpton, who looked at you and said, this kid's got something. He's got something that I think is interesting. Boy, it'd be interesting to work with him sometime. Is that how it went? Yes. And there's people, specific people involved. There's, uh, I, we inter I've inter co-interviewed him, Bill Plimpton, with Raul Aguirre Jr. on the Man vs. Art podcast. Man vs. Art um, podcast. Everybody should listen yeah. to that, too. That guy through, pulls no punches. Through, that's a great podcast. Through Pe Ken Mora, our friend Ken Mora, um, he, he got us that opportunity through Alexia Anastasio and Kevin Michaels. Uh, they helped cultivate, you know, probably said nice things when I wasn't there to Bill. 
<laughs> but ultimately, it came down to Bill watching my stuff and realizing, because I've done this with other people. Uh, I've, I've come across artists that spark creativity within me. And I think maybe Bill watching my stuff and realizing that, oh, one guy is doing most of this. I think that kind of like, wow, this is cool. Like, like he was actually genuinely interested in, in my work. Um, so that's how that happened. And then I met him a few times and I've never, ever, ever I asked him for anything. I think I asked him to hand me a napkin one time. <laughs> and I think, uh, I think that has something to do with it too. I wasn't pushy with him and I wasn't looking to like, oh, by being friends with Bill, I'll gain, you know, oh I'll gain gosh. the kingdom. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, I, oh, I don't know how many times I've gone to conventions and you have those friends like Jim who just want to just talk with interesting people. And if something comes out of that relationship, great, but that's not the point. The point is just yeah. to have interesting interactions with interesting people. And then there's the people who lead with, like, who do you know? Who yeah. do you know who, that I should know? Because this is all about a ladder climb, after all. This is a vertical thing, right? It's not a horizontal thing. Yeah. Um, God, that, that is there's awesome. A, there's a book I want to recommend. Yes. That Alexia Anastasio, she directed the documentary on Bill Plimpton, Adventures in Plimptoons. And she recommended a book to me called Never Eat Alone. It's by Keith Ferrazzi. And basically, to summarize this book, it's about networking without being a, a D-bag. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's about networking without just being a total fake and phony. Networking gets you everywhere because it is who you – ultimately, it is who you know. I don't care how good you are. Somebody has to go, okay, I'll let you on my network. Well, it, and, um, it matters how good you are, but it also matters that people see the good stuff that you make. Right? right, but if you keep that good stuff to yourself, nobody right. ever makes it alone. Right. Everybody has, even Prince has a team behind him. That's, and, you, and you have to cultivate these relationships, but you have to be real too. And, um, and I look back. I look back at like, the good things that have happened, and it's happened because of networking in a – in a real way, and at the same time, try to be as good as you can. Try to be so good that they can't deny you. Mm -hmm. You know, so the the combination of those two things is a is a really helpful thing. To, so anybody starting out to, people can smell desperation. Yeah. So even if you are desperate, don't act desperate. Just yeah. and then listen to the audiences. Listen to what they tell you about your work. Because if everybody tells you, I like your work, but everybody has buck teeth in your drawings. Think about that. Did you want to be the known as the buck teeth cartoonist or, you know, right. if that's your thing, then go for it. But listen to the audience. Like they, they don't argue with the audience. They're, they're the final judge. There's, there's a sense sometimes I notice with the, the desperate type that you're talking about is that they, there's this kind of like agenda and this, this interaction must have some kind of an outcome. There must be a takeaway. I must have some, some substantive change in my life after talking with this person and there's like that pressure on. And when I talked with you, like when we were hanging out in Kentucky at the <clears throat> outfair a few years back, none of that was there. None of that was there. It was just this sense of what's happening around us. Are we responding to it, making comments on it, and making comments on each other's work? Um, I remember one of the nicest things I've ever heard in my entire life was when we were at that up fair, and it was from you. Uh, and we don't have to bring it into the show, but it was just, it was this kind of like, there was no pressure for us to somehow, and we should work together, right? It was none of that kind of nonsense. It was like, <laughs> it was just like a general appreciation of one another kind of thing. It was, it was, uh, See, Jer by Jersey saying that, what I really said was, no, Jersey, I don't want to work with you. <laughs> so he, he translated it. He kind of switched a few words around. But I understand. I, I read point with Look, Jim, when you live my life, you have to retcon everything. <laughs> well, That's I am, all I've I'm got. I'm the master of analogies. I just yeah. th I thought of this one right now. It's, okay. As, as a creative artist, we're all in this ocean together, right? Everybody's floating in this ocean from, you know, and there's sharks in the water. There are sharks down there circling down there. What difference does it matter if you just float there and be cool about it? Or if you're the guy kicking your feet, right. you know, the sharks can tell. Right. So in other words, if you, everybody's desperate, we're all desperate artists. I probably, um, shoot, probably the most successful artist you can think of is still probably has a, there is a level of desperation there because he wants to continue it. Yeah. Um, but the thing is, uh, to quote Fonzie, 
be cool, shortcake. <laughs> because because it, what difference does it matter at the end of the day? If you act like an, a desperate person and you're, and you're looking for every opportunity and you'll step over everybody and on their throat, you know, what's the difference if you're that guy or just a guy like, look, I'm going to – when opportunities happen, I'll, I'll go after them. I'll be aggressive, but I'm not going to be desperate. Right. I'm, right. I, if, if the answer is no, I'm cool. I'll can walk away. You know, uh, you just, you just, that was a really nice, succinct way to sum up the distinction is there's a difference between being aggressive and desperate. Right. Um, yeah. Because yeah. we're all desperate. Everybody's desperate. Yeah. Uh, so this, this film, Revengeance, is coming out. You guys are going to be doing a trailer or a preview at San Diego Comic-Con. That's what I hear. Yeah. We're right now at the very early stages of it. I wrote the script. Uh, um, Bill has the script. And he's finishing up another project right now. And then he's going to start work on it in the next couple of months. Um, we were talking about having, yeah, we'd like to have a, a, a something to show the audience, a preview at Comic-Con. And I think this is going to be another forever land, except... Bill is going to be the Jim Lujan in this one, I think, because he's doing the drawing and, and the animating. And I think, um, and I'm I'm designing and doing a lot of voices and a lot of music for it. Wow. And uh, what what can I say about it? It's so early on. Now I know how J.J. Abrams feels. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, it's so early on. It's like it, you know, it, you know, like timelines are. I'm not. You know, I could just say I'm not at liberty to discuss the timelines, right. but I would es I would guesstimate that we're going to have something for Comic Con, and what I can tell you though is, I really do believe this film will not disappoint Bill Plimpton fans, but at the same time will open up a lot of eyeballs. It's very um, '70s uh, grindhouse, you know, but it's not it's not a, it's going to be a PG-13. It won't be an R. But it's very wild and tons of characters, tons and tons of – there's action in it. There's all kinds of fun stuff that's going to happen in it. And there's lots of motorcycles. <laughs> that you don't have to draw, thankfully. I don't have to draw. He said he likes to draw motorcycles, and I hope he meant that. Cause... He's got to be the only person on the planet to ever say that. Yeah, well, he's – the guy loves drawing. The guy lives to draw. He can draw for hours. I, I – He's been quoted many times as saying, like, oh, he'll work. He'll wake up at 5 a.m., start working on something for about five hours, go to lunch or whatever, come back, work for another, you know, four hours, go home, have dinner, you know, spend some time. Then at night, work another, you know, five, six hours. Or, and, and I used to think, that sounds incredibly crazy. But then when I had the opportunity to do it with Foreverland, it's like I, I realized, okay, that's how – because when you sit down and start creating, the time just flies. It goes – Flies away, flies away. So yeah, I understand that. Especially when you're working on something you're actually excited to do. And Bill Plimpton's yeah. one of those guys who's kind of led the, the charge and like I'm not going to do anything that compromises what my, my vision or my style or my approach right. is. Right. Yeah. It's right. gotta be good. It's yeah. gotta be good. And I hope I can I hope I can take some of the load off of his shoulders when the time does come to promote it, because I will be a podcasting harlot. Well you'll come back. You come back on yes. comics are great. Uh, I, I I would just want to do it just to talk with you anyway. Uh, but uh, and and I want to uh, after the experience is over, what I'm really curious about, and this will be will earmark this for future discussion, is navigating the relationship with a, a hero when you finally get to work with them. Like, how do you do yeah. that? Yeah, like do because like there's. You know, I'm I'm working on a book right now with one of my personal heroes, and it was a struggle to go from. You know, how deferential should I be? This guy's the Wait master. a minute. I thought John Wayne Gacy died. <laughs> <laughs> Am I mistaken? <laughs> I'm sorry. Look for I, it this yeah. September, everybody. <laughs> okay, Actually, it was Tanya Harding. Gosh. <laughs> she can't write. Come on, now. <laughs> well, you know, I'm ghosting for her. But... Uh, but anyway, but yeah, you know, I think that that's that's a whole fat, whole other fascinating ball of wax. But we'll get to that next time. But for now, we got to do book recommendations. Uh, oh, I want to give you a final thought before we go into book recommendations, Jim. Anything that we missed? I just gave my wife a kiss. <laughs> She's leaving me. She's leaving me. She's leaving me. That was good. <laughs> Most people pay for that on a webcam. 
Hey, I got a. I, okay. I have a book recommendation. Okay, you can go first. Can Can I really recommend a couple? Okay. Yes, please. All right. While you get While you get those, I'll introduce Rachel Moyer, who is here okay. from the Ann Arbor District Library. Hey, hey, hey Rachel. Uh, is your mic on? No, is it on? Then okay, now, now it's on. It, it's oh. on. Hmm. Now it's on. So um, you are a PLA at the Ann Arbor District Library. You are taking over more and more of the responsibilities of the comics events happening here. Yes. And some neat stuff going on at comics.aadl.org. Hopefully even more neat stuff in the future. We're kind of trying to add more stuff to it. So if you have any suggestions for things you want to see on our website, if you could email me at comics.aadl.org, that would be awesome because I am drowning in lists of resources and yeah. books and DVDs and all sorts of things to recommend to people. So, so yes, go to comics.aadl.org or email comics at aadl.org. Uh, almost exactly the same, so that's confusing, but, you know, <laughs> makes it easy to remember. Just change one punctuation mark. Yeah, there. change the punctuation mark to an ampersand. So what books did you want to recommend this week? All right. Um, uh, oh, Joe, oh, we're going with... We're go <laughs> Hi, Rachel. Hey the there. <laughs> so, Rachel, what do you got? All right. First, I've got Supergirl Cosmic Adventures in the Eighth Grade, which is one of those kind of books that, you know, it's aimed at people that still think eighth grade sounds awesome. <laughs> but it is an awesome book. It's kind of um, a little more wacky than I think most uh, comics aimed at, like, younger girls tend to be. It's... It, it plays with Supergirl's origin a little bit. This is a Supergirl who, instead of being, you know, another last survivor of Krypton, um, ended up in a... She climbed in her parents' rocket, and in this case, uh, Argo, where she, Supergirl is from, is not another place that ended up being destroyed. It's not the city, it's a moon, mm. and it's in a different dimension, but it's still okay, it's still <laughs> all there. But she gets mad at her parents and because they won't let her go to something, you know, just standard teenager problems. Okay. And... Her dad's sending a rocket across dimensions to send a message to Superman, and she gets angry and hides in it, and then ends up stranded on Earth and has to... So this is non-canonical. Definitely non-canonical, <laughs> which is why it's kind of great. Um, it's kind of like a uh, poor Supergirl it just kind of had a hissy fit, ended up on Earth, and now has to deal with you know all the standard problems of school, but they're kind of turned up to 11 because, like, hey, she doesn't know that, you know... You have New York City in New York State. Is there a New York country as well? And everyone's <laughs> laughing at her all the time. She can't oh, control her powers. But so she's the odd duck new kid, but even yeah, more odd duck new kid. Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. But it's a lot of fun. It was, unfortunately, another one of those kid series that was pretty short-lived. I think it was only six issues. But it is a really, really great comic to give to younger girls, especially if you want to, you know convince them to join our group which is uh kind of what i have done with several young cousins but they love it it's well let me let me ask you this um because I, I was just reading brianne Druhart was recently at the emerald city comic con and she was mm -hmm. posting some really awesome sketches of wonder woman mm -hmm. and she told the story about these little girls who were schooling her on wonder woman mythology mm -hmm. you know uh, you know that wonder girl is not her only sister you know okay <laughs> um, yeah but um I guess a lot of the parents were saying, thank you for, you know, being here and doing this because our daughters don't have many superheroes for them. Right. Now, you were a young girl. You mm -hmm. read superhero comics. Did that did that uh, cross your radar or were you just thinking like, Superman is so great? <laughs> <laughs> well, there was that. Uh, I mean, I think because of where I fell in terms of like the development of the cartoons associated with DC comics, especially um, uh. a lot of the stuff that when I was, you know, seventh grade on um, that stuff was like the Bruce Tim stuff. So mm. I had like justice league and the, uh, the teen, Car teen Titans cartoon, which isn't Bruce Tim, but was right. also, you know, they've got Starfire and Raven and you've got Hawkgirl and wonder woman. And you, so there was a little bit more of that, I think, um, Right now, it's kind. It's a little weird right now, I think, in terms of DC animation, because you know you have the Young Justice was actually extremely popular with girls, and then mm -hmm. you get uh, these articles coming out from the creators of that cartoon saying, "Hey, uh, we kind of got canceled partially yeah. because of that, because of that's what a huge portion of our audience was, and that's not what Cartoon Network was looking for." So, I don't know. Um, it's always a toss up. Uh, yeah. I think a lot of at least people in their young 20s, people my age right now, girls, are looking a lot more towards stuff that's not mainstream comics. Mm. You'll see a lot of people getting really excited about webcomics because that, that is a much more 
female dominated sphere in comics well more, more representation at least for sure and then i have seen so many people who have been super excited about stuff like uh carol dan versus captain marvel or the new ms marvel or um upcoming from boom the lumberjanes series that's mm. going to be coming out that one's getting a lot of people excited because it's kind of you know yeah. gravity falls times um I don't remember what I, I've heard it like explained as Gravity Falls plus uh, like Scooby Doo sort of thing hmm. plus Girl Scouts like it, it's all girls at a summer camp with supernatural mystery sort of thing but hmm. you know I don't know that DC is putting out a lot of stuff right now that would be in the same kind of uh, right like something for eleven year old girls yeah th in terms yeah. of like the younger kids like that. Middle school, pre-middle school, I think, is kind of an underserved bracket so in terms of superhero this, stuff. That makes this that much more special. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. Because, yeah. you know, you can give a, even younger kids something like Tiny Titans or any of, like, the all really, uh, like, the readers type stuff with, you know, the big heroes. You've got, like, Learn to Read with Superman or Batman or Wonder Woman. But there's kind of, like... Um, a desert, a dry area there that I think Supergirl and Cosmic Adventures in the 8th grade kind of slots right in there. It's sort of like the transition period that might you know, keep them actually interested in it as they go on. But hmm. Oh, cool. Alright, well, so but there's at least this and there's, there's a few others. But There I are, get there are definitely uh, quite a few other sorts of things like this. You just kind of you have to n be in the know. It's a little difficult to find them sometimes. I yeah. know I recommended Thor: The Mighty Avenger. I think that kind of fits yeah, in there I think as so well. Too. So, so this other one, this one is not for eleven-year-old girls, or is it? Which one am I grabbing for? Full Metal. Oh, okay, okay, Full Metal Alchemist. This is one of those mangas that I feel like I forget to re recommend to people because I just assume that everyone knows about it and <laughs> loves it as much as I do because it's such. Um, both a really popular work and a really quality work. Uh, so I'm just going to pretend no one knows what it is. Um, okay. So Full Metal Alchemist, uh, it takes place in a world where you have this really developed science that functions almost as magic called alchemy. And it centers around the Elric brothers who commit a taboo in alchemy. They're really um, highly advanced for their age, young boys who commit this taboo because of something really tragic that's happened in their life and it ends up with one of them losing an arm and a leg and the other one being like thrown out of his body entirely and he gets tr basically trapped in a suit of armor so it starts out as their quest to regain their bodies but it it develops much much more than that it, it well, it's hard to boil it down like what this is about because it's about so many things. It's a thick book and this is just oh, the first three that's volumes. That's the first three volumes. There's right. 27 volumes total. Um, Holy moly. Yeah, and you know, you hear that, you hear, oh, 27 volumes, that's a lot. And you think, it, you're so hit and miss with long manga like that about mm -hmm. how loose the storytelling gets. Mm -hmm. But Full Metal Alchemist is amazing because it's that long, but it's really tight storytelling. There's not much in there that I think you could take out without really damaging the quality of the story. Wow, and like I said, it's hard to say just what it's about because it's it's about everything from you know dealing with war and r racial genocide and desperation and <laughs> revenge and you know friendship is a huge theme and familial love and you know yeah well with a series that long you're going to broach a lot of subjects right, right? well yeah. it's just really well done really deep cast of characters all very well fleshed out. And talking again about, you know, stories for girls, maybe not for young girls, but there are a lot of female characters in there that are also really well done, it, which it's not surprising considering um, uh, Hiromu Ar Ar Arakawa, I can never pronounce names, uh, is herself a woman. So there's a, you know, she has a little bit of an inside track there. But yeah. um, it's definitely a, a comic I think everyone should give a go, even if you've um, seen the first anime. Uh, the first anime is actually completely different. It's one of those instances where oh, yeah. they started making the anime while the manga was still being made, hit the point where the manga was completed to that point, and then they were just like, we're going to make up our own story from here. Uh -huh. And it's completely different, completely different characterization, completely different themes, everything. Uh. It kind of ends on a downer note, and this, despite all of the um, dark places it does end up going, it actually ends on a really uh, strong uplifting note which mm. i think is 
pretty awesome. I like the uplifting kind of end. Positive. Realistically uplifting. Okay. So. And then... Lastly, I have... And I have a little bit of agenda in recommending this because we have it here at the library, but look how skinny this is. It's kind of hard to see on a library shelf. Um, yeah. This is Murder, She Writes. Mm. It's a little self-contained story by John Allison of Scary Go Round and Bad Machinery fame and stars two characters that are in both of those comics, which are Shelley Winters and Charlotte Grote. Uh, it's basically just a kind of goofy murder mystery. Um, Shelley Winters is a children's book writer and Charlotte is her intern and they go to a writer's retreat and people start dying. So uh, Charlotte, being the intrepid young girl she is, solves the murder mystery while everyone else is sort of flailing about and getting drunk and being very absurd. It's got um, John Allison's signature sense of humor, which is a little bit absurd, very British. Uh, yeah, a little dry. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. can definitely tell he's from across the pond, which is part of the draw, at least for me. <laughs> but um, it's a great little self-contained story. Um, I'm not sure if it's still available on his website. I know with a lot of these kind of self-contained things that he posted, he would put it on the website for a, a while. Like, he'd serialize it, then take it off, mm -hmm. at least, like, with Giant Days. Um, I'm not sure if Murder, She Writes is what, that case, but if it is, we have the copy right here at AADL, so you could check it out. So it's not just a place to get the most popular books. It's a place to get out-of-the-way rare books, too. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Comics.aadl.org. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, Jim, what do you got? Oh, man. I've got some good ones. <clears throat> All right. I would be totally burned at the stake if I didn't promote my two good buddies first. Uh, Jose, the, art, the sumo art of Jose Cabrera. Just really, let me find something good here. Really colorful. Um, amazing, amazing, just craziest art you've ever seen. <laughs> Jose does not do drugs. But it's just <laughs> Is that a geisha with a lion head? Yes. I mean, there's sumos in the subway. There's sumos. Oh, I like this one. They're fighting over a broken Budweiser bottle. <laughs> but uh, just... The colors are amazing. Drugs, kids, do this book. Ah. You will, you will feel it. Um, next, I have uh, My Pickle Taste Funny by Lonnie Millsap. And this book is available lots of comic book shops and bookstores and things. And... Uh, very, I'm going to find a random cartoon. Uh, <laughs> they're all uh, uh, <laughs> they're all very appropriate. Uh, here's one. Uh, it's a Sasquatch dating. Uh, the uh, Sasquatch.com dating disappointment. <laughs> where he's saying you look much taller in your profile picture. Uh, <laughs> and much I mean, hairier. It's, it's very uh, far side ish Very well. Okay. And those are my two good buddies. And, uh, you know, you have Jim on your show. They're going to get mentioned. So, um, Got another one, though. This, okay. one, this one, um, uh, I corresponded with this guy and super nice guy. But I was a fan of this guy's work for a long time. And I always, I always promote his stuff whenever I can. But his name is Joe Olman. This, I think, was his, maybe his first book, Chewing on Tin Foil. Hmm. Joe Olman. Um, his latest one is called Science Fiction, and uh, it's about um, – Chewing on Tinfoil is an anthology. It's a collection of a bunch of short stories, you know, seven, eight-page stories, just all kinds of crazy stuff. But this is a good example of his, his style. Uh, science Fiction, it's about a school teacher that uh, is fighting with these repressed memories of what could possibly, possibly be an alien abduction. Mm. But it's not a – it's not – I mean, it's – Real world stuff, but in a funny, very funny uh, style. And uh, he's just, his acting of his characters is so good. The way he draws them, the way they pause, and, and it's kind of four panel, you know, uh, told in that style. Um, so those are my suggestions. Uh, and uh, you'll be happy uh, to <laughs> purchase any of those. And we will link to them in the show notes. By the way, everybody, this show will be archived at comicsaregreat.com slash CAG96. Jim, thank you so much for hanging out with me for an hour. This thank is super you, fun. guys. Thank you. And thank you, Eric, for posting all these links. I'm looking at the live feed, and it's like we mentioned something. So if I mention, like, NAMBLA, will he post <laughs> a link to NAMBLA? 
<laughs> he or, probably uh, won't. No, he's shaking no. his head back there. No, he's shaking his no, hands. No. No. Eric, there are li there are li there's a line, Eric. There's a line. Don't cross that line. <laughs> well, I think these links show up in his Google Plus feed as well, so that's not something <laughs> he needs to be dropped in there out of context. Um, I want to promote Al-Qaeda.com. <laughs> And let's see what else. Uh, <laughs> but Jim, please say that you'll be back uh, at least to talk about uh, Revengeance when it comes out. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, thank you f very much. for. I was looking very forward to this all week. I'm like, oh, again, okay, I get to be on the show. Uh, so I, it, was, it was a thrill. And this is, you're doing the right thing, Jersey. This is a good, good format for you. Oh, thanks. We can I see your bright smile. <laughs> Oh, wait, and one last thing before I go. Somebody yes. wants to say goodbye. Oh, God. <laughs> I had such a good time on the show, and uh, let's just call this the opening act. <laughs> <laughs> and there, there's some more puppet stress nightmares for me. Uh, <laughs> all right, thank you once again. Jim Lujan can be found at jimluhan.com. Go subscribe to his YouTube page. Go watch... Uh, Foreverland, counterclockwise in Foreverland. You won't be sorry. It's a great thing to put on in the background while you're drawing cartoonists. Uh, and uh, there's a ton of videos on his YouTube page that you should go check out today. And that's at youtube.com slash Jim Lujan, right? That's right. And I'm available for ads. Mm. Advertisers out there. I'm available to do advertisements. Oh. Check me. Good to know. Yeah. All right, cool. Um, all right, so thanks again to Jim Lujan. Uh, oh, you're also Jim Lujan on Twitter and Facebook and all the other I'm social Always places. Jim Lujan everywhere always, I go. Always. <laughs> Thank you to Rachel Moyer for uh, you know helping out with all the comics events. By the way, this Sunday, April 6th, 1 to 3 p.m. at the Comics Artist Forum. we got Joshua Hope coming up to do a talk. Oh, yeah. It's going to be fun. And then just general hanging out and kvitzing with uh, and kvetching with other cartoonists and schlepping and possibly some other th uh, Yiddish words. And thank you to Matt Dubay in the control room and Eric Closter in the control room for putting this show together. Thanks to the Ann Arbor District Library for letting me do this show every two weeks. We'll be back in two weeks. We're going to talk about Batman next time. We're going to have uh, Cole Glass on again. We're going to just nerd out over why Batman is so great. Uh, and it should be a fun one. So until then, everybody, I have been Jersey Drozd of ComicsAreGreat.com and Jersey on Twitter. Okay, bye. <laughs>